Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Michelle DeLima. I'm the engagement manager for the trustees Boston Community Gardens. Um, we have 56 community gardens in different neighborhoods of Boston. We work closely with volunteer coordinators to keep those full of people growing food. Um, and we also run a lot of programs. So this past year, most of those programs have been virtual. This coming year, we're going to be, we're starting off with some virtual programming, but we're going to be doing some hybrid stuff where we'll have a limited number of people in person at gardens, and then we'll also stream them on Zoom. So it remains to be seen how that goes, but we're excited to try it. Um, we've been really amazed at this outpouring of interest in gardening stuff, and we really want to support people continuing to be able to access it, however is you know easiest and most comfortable for them. So I'll put a link in the chat. Um, our workshop series is called Seed, Sow, and Grow, and we have some great things coming up. We have a backyard chickens workshop with Christy Smith of Yard Birds, Backyard Birds um, this coming Saturday. Then we have container gardening, um, no-till gardening, um, trellising, high-yield gardening, and we also do some other classes like um, I, I run garden mixology classes. They're called garden. It's actually mostly foraged, abundant stuff that we forage and um, do take home mixology classes and dinners and things like that. So I'll put the link for where you can find out more about all of that in the chat. Um, and now I'm excited to co-host this with Bill and have Bill teach us how to make a Mason Bee House. I think a lot of you were probably at Thursday's talk um, that was with Nick Dorian. That was more of a, a look at, you know, the broader world of native bees and their, their, um, life cycles and stuff like that. And if you missed that, just let me know if you wanna watch it, I can send you a link. Um, so you'll all be getting an email from me or anyone who registered through the trustees. And if not, Bill will forward it to you um, with a recording of this talk afterwards. So you can also just reply to that and ask for the link to the other one. Um, all right, great, I'll hand it over to you, Bill. Okay, thanks Michelle. Always fun to co-host with you. I really appreciate it. That's a wonderful match. Um, so hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'll try and make this short so we can get back outside and dig in the garden or build our mason bee houses. Um, so we're going to talk about um, assembling a bee house for the mason bees. And mason bees are a pretty large uh, group of bees. It's not just the, uh, the orchard mason bee that you see here, which is quite common uh, here and throughout a lot of the United States. Uh, but there are many, many other mason bees, but the one of the characteristics that sets them apart um, for the most part from the other bees is that um, they are solitary like almost all of the bees, um, uh, unlike honeybees and, and some bumblebees, uh, but they, um, uh, they, they nest in, in holes. Uh, the other night, Nick uh, uh, referred to them as renters, so they'll find a hole that may be left over from a beetle emerging from a trunk of a tree or something, and they'll uh, pop in there, uh, lay a series of eggs, and um, and and, uh, and and seal each compartment with mud, which is where the mason part of it comes from. Um, so you'll uh, like other bees; they're covered in hair. Those hairs pick up pollen as they fly from flower to flower. They're amazing pollinators, uh, but the uh, the most distinct um, characteristic that sets mason bees apart from all other bees is that they're so adorable. So um, once you start looking for them, uh, you won't stop. It's really a lot of fun. And hopefully you'll see them in your um, making a house out of your uh, mason bee house, making a home out of your mason bee house uh, quite soon. Um, there, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but it, oh, it, it comes up later, but, the, but now is about the time that you might start seeing them. Um, these are all the bees here, and the honeybees and are, are right up here next to the bumblebees. Um, but uh, this group right here, uh, the Megachilidae, I'm probably saying that wrong, but those are all the mason bees. So it's a pretty large group of all of the bees. And some of these other ones are the, the cellophane bees that Nick studies and, and, um, um, and uh, gee, they're, yeah, the, uh, sweat bees are a big one too. Um, in in this group, though, in, in the group with uh, the mason bees are the what uh, what some people call the leaf cutter bees. Um, they also are renters, so to speak, making holes in cavities. 
um, they are champion pollinators. And let me just uh, sum it up by saying that one mason bee, because of their frenetic activity and their uh, physiology uh, and their determination, they are very focused on their job. Uh, they do the work of uh, uh, 50 to 100 uh, uh, honeybees. Um, so um, they are really quite, um, they are quite the pollinators. And a lot of people are realizing that, even farmers around here and starting to, to encourage them. Uh, a place like uh, uh, California and the almond orchards, it's, it's a lost cause. They really have to rely on honeybees, which is incidentally happening right now. A uh, million beehives have been driven to California to pollinate the almond orchards. But those are the honeybees that we're so familiar with. Um, there's not enough forage for uh, the native bees in that area once the once the uh, almonds have all um, flowered and and, um, and so that's the, one of the problems with monoculture. So um, if they planted more wildflowers, perhaps in the windrows and places like that, perhaps they could encourage more native bees. Hopefully they'll get to that. So we know they're great pollinators. They're solitary, although they're happily, although that's a very um, uh, human trait, right? They're, they're, they're um, they're, they adapt well to other bees being around them. So um, that's why if we make these nests and you can see there are three different versions here. Um, if we make these nests and put lots of tubes in, in a tight cluster, they're not social, they don't work with one another, but they'll, they're happy to nest next to one another. Right? All they want is that hole, that hole of the right size. Um, they make use of found holes. I love these pictures because there's one. The one in the brick wall, uh, that's pretty amazing. And I think that's a telephone pole, the one on the upper right. Um, and there's even one that nests in little snail nails, snail shells, sorry. <laughs> um, if you were to open up one of the uh, telephone poles or a uh, tube like the ones we'll be using today, um, this is what you would see inside. The, they, uh, they, the, so they're entering from the right and nesting and, and going to the back end of the tube, which is to the left. They provision it with uh, nectar and pollen, uh, the same as a honeybee would feed its babies, right? But, um, but then they lay an egg on the nectar and pollen, and then they use uh, mud and create a cell or a section. And then they do it again and again and again. And you can actually see uh, the eggs in these pictures. They're huge compared to the, the bee herself. So. Um, if you look at an egg that comes out of a queen bee in a, in a honey bee nest, a honey bee hive, uh, th that egg is probably about a thousandth the size of, uh, of a grain of rice. So I think it's fair to say that it's a lot smaller than these eggs. They'll do that again and again. The females are the ones in the back, the fertilized eggs. The male eggs are usually going to be the two or three at the front end, and they'll do six or seven of these, uh, five, six, seven, um, in a tube that's in a hole that's four to seven inches deep. Um, and, the, and the males then will emerge first and, um, and be ready when the females come out. They mate and the males are done with their job and the, the females go about uh, making a new nest. Um, so they, we know they're pollen, great pollinators, they're solitary, make use of found holes. They're compartmentalized and um, each egg is sealed in a chamber that we just saw. This picture, I think Nick had a, maybe the identical picture, but some of these leaf cutter variety bees, uh, instead of lining their nest with leaves, they use flower petals. Um, and I think Nick was saying that uh, some waxes and things like that on flower petals might have an antimicrobial effect. So um, it would actually protect them. Upper left, uh, a leaf cutter. There's another bee there in the middle. It looks like it's using a resin of some sort. I remember reading about that, but I can't remember what that is. And then the bottom one there is a, a, a could be a mason bee because those uh, cocoons there look very similar. Those dark brown cocoons, like the ones in the middle picture on the top, uh, they look pretty mason bee-like. Um, there's a little leaf cutter at the bottom center doing its bringing in a leaf. So that you will see. Now, um, before I forget, I probably might forget later, so I'll say it now. Leaf cutters are a little bit smaller. They uh, prefer a smaller hole. 
So that's why it's good when you're building these uh, nests um, to, to offer different size holes. Um, so um, um, it's fun to see those little girls coming in. Uh, males emerge first, something I already mentioned. Um, so the lifespan is that they come out around here around April 1st. Uh, for six weeks, they're madly mating and filling and provisioning those cells, laying eggs, and then it's that's done. They're done. And then um, uh, there's a quick uh, picture of the, you know where their where, where their activity is, and it's sort of hard to see you know where they are out and active. But if you look where where it says nesting, that's basically that's where the bee is in the adult stage, the, uh, the female for the most part in the adult stage, uh, getting her nest ready and provisioning it. And then uh, by, by sort of mid to late May, she's dead. Development above that and pre-wintering and wintering, it all refers to the, the, uh, the egg larvae pupa stage of uh, development of the, of the bee. Um, it all happens in the tube. So basically these bees are in that they develop uh, from the egg in the tube and they're in there um, for uh, 11, 10 and a half months of the year. Really. Yeah. Um, and then I believe this might be the last slide except for some pictures, but um, these bees do get parasitized. And I was astounded to see this picture on the lower right there. Those are all mites, uh, something that uh, honeybee beekeepers are very familiar with, not these particular mites, but, but um, I, I always thought they, they, they always, uh, there are these companies that sell uh, mason bee houses and blocks and things like that. And you're supposed to clean them out and harvest the uh, chrysalises and keep them over winter and such. And I kind of thought it was all hooky because the mason bees are very capable of doing all of this themselves, of course, you know, and out of nature and all, but um, it, it, it is, um, Mites and other pests are really, uh, it could be an issue. Um, so if you wanna maximize their survival rates, uh, it does mean intervening. Um, so um, uh, these are all the parasites that could get to them. Uh, another way, so one way is that you, once the bee has used one of these tubes, then you, um, you actually split it open and harvest the, the cocoon uh, and uh, you know, I'm sorry, but I forget what time of year, but I, I, I can figure that out in a minute. Um, you harvest the cocoon, put it in a, a like a raspberry uh, container that you would have in, that, that you would have in your fridge. You, you put a little tissue paper in the bottom and wet it and put the cocoons in there and keep them there until um, uh, the weather uh, is, is optimum, which is around 50 degrees on a pretty consistent level. Um, and you bring it outside and they, they hatch, uh, they emerge. Um, so the other way you can protect them is uh, by putting wire, by putting screen in front of them, because there are a lot of like woodpeckers and, and uh, uh, other, um, well, they're the main ones, but there are also some of those parasitic wasps that you might've seen. So if you, if you somehow screen it off, you might be able to avoid um, some of the uh, some other parasites. On the right, you see uh, a pretty active uh, set of tubes that somebody set out. Um, all the ones that are flush with mud are active and and have been uh, uh, filled. Uh, and there are a few bees you can see emerging, either emerging or building their nests. Um, so these are some examples of. Uh, bee houses. The one on the bottom left, I think, is just the simplest one. You you do need to protect these tubes once you've uh, once you've uh, made them. You you need to protect them from from rain, from weather, uh, and a two inch overhang or something like that. I think that's what Nick suggested is probably sufficient. Um, uh, they you know once there the mud is there, that's why it's there to protect it from weather. But you can also you know, improve their, uh, improve the, the uh, integrity of the nest by, by uh, covering the front a little bit. Um, and I, I uh, in searching around for pictures, I found this one on the right. And it's not, I don't think there are any mason bee homes in there, but it's 
what is referred to as sort of an insect nursery. So it's a place with different kind of uh, different uh, sort of uh, environments for for you know the millions of or tens of thousands of insects that we have around here that might prefer one of those uh, rocky ledges or um, burlap rolled up or something like that. So um, with uh, insect populations plummeting the way they are, I mean, there's, there's more and more reports of really precipitous drops in insect populations. Maybe something like this would be kind of um, kind and fun at the same time. Um, so I also have here uh, some references. Um, there's a, a bumblebee nest box you can build that's really pretty simple. And we do have a lot of bumblebees that are looking for nests uh, in the next day or two. I mean, probably perhaps some of them are out there now. Um, uh, and some general treatments about native bees as well. There's one, uh, I think, um, good, clean housing versus cheapo death traps. Um, so they, they, they're, um, you know, you'll see more in there about, you know, cleaning out the, the tubes once you've made them. Um, the tubes, oh, one thing that Nick mentioned was that uh, uh, some of the mason bees use um, sort of reeds, right? And a lot of us who garden might have raspberry reeds and we, we uh, cane them right to about three feet every year. And, the, and, and, um, and they will either grow back or die and send up new roots, those the, the canes themselves. And if they do die, um, it's you suggested strongly that you leave them um, and not only leave them for a year, but for two years, because once they die, then the mason bee will, will dig, that, dig out um, a hole uh, in the pip part of the middle of the raspberry and, uh, and nest in there. But it's not until the next year that they emerge. So you really have to leave them for a couple of years. You, you can trim them and then stick them somewhere. Um, but stick them somewhere in a similar environment because they chose that hole because it was in the right place, you know, and it, and it all could be um, the right environment, right? Um, so um, today we're going to use um, for our nest. We're going to um, we're going to use uh, Phragmites, which is a horrible uh, invasive species that um, has a very long stalk, sometimes. Like 20 feet long, I think I measured one, and uh, it's um, it grows uh, in the fens if you're in the city, uh, and that's where I got the reeds that we're going to use today. Um, but uh, you can find them in a lot of marshy areas where there used to be cattail. Uh, they've pretty much taken over everything. Um, when you're harvesting them, please lop off this flower on the top or the uh, the seed. Uh, dispersal mechanism, whatever it's called, um, the spray. Uh, lop it off and leave it because, uh, as you can see, that the they're starting to fly around the room here. And each one of those has a seed, and if it lands in a nice cattail marsh, it's doomsday. Um, if you go down further uh, along that 15 foot length of reed, you'll see that the um, they're hollow and and also sectional. So you can see the section there up to the end. And then there was probably another section right around here. Um, let's see, I'll put down the flower portion and there's a section right there. And then there's a section right here. So that's a pretty long one. And these are the ones you wanna look for. Um, as a guide, if you can get a pencil in there, that's an average size. Okay, so you remember you want some a little smaller and some a little larger. Um, and I just cut them off, um, you know, right in the middle of the section to, to carry them home because I, so that section where I cut it is not going to be usable. Um, and um, good. So I'm going to take you outside and we'll do a little chopping and we'll finish off one of these things pretty quick. Oh. Uh, uh, you want to, sorry, um, a tin can that's five inches approximately, or maybe a little more, right? Um, this one's exactly five inches, and I'm not completely happy with it, but I can't seem to find the one that I brought over that's six inches long. So um, until I do this, we'll have to work. Um, and um, 
And again, you want a little covering for it. So um, these uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, cups are ubiquitous and drive me crazy. So um, I found a new use for them. And that is for the overhang um, for the, our neck. So when, when we're done filling this with tubes from the Phragmites, we're gonna cover it with this gum. Um, with this overhang. Before I forget, um, you can nail this or screw this if you can figure out how to the side of a building, but it's or, or fix it somewhere. If you decide to use this, you can use that wooden design like I showed you earlier, which is really pretty simple to make. It's four pieces of wooden. Just nail them together. Um, but right, Bill, Bill, could, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could you stop sharing your screen so your video is larger and oh, can see you better? Yeah. Yep, Thank yep. you. Thank you. Uh, stop sharing it because, yep, good idea. Um, so, can uh, I can just, um, what I was going to say is that it's very important that these don't move once you these are It has to stay completely still because any kind of movement will jostle the egg and maybe it'll fall off that little, um, the bee bread that the, the, the food that the mother, uh, the queen really, she is the, the, uh, set in there for. So don't let these move when you, when you put your can in, make sure it doesn't move. Okay, so let's um, venture outside. Uh, oh, I have to take a chair. <laughs> I've already cut a few of these. We only need to do two or three. So these really are the best breeds. I would not use uh, bamboo because uh, you are going to harvest. You can't harvest bamboo. It's really difficult to split it. But these things split very easily. So at the end of the nesting season, after they've pupated, and again, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when that is perhaps by looking at the at some of the literature that I've uh, uh, referenced, maybe you'll see it there. But um, after they pupate and when it's time to harvest the pupa, um, uh, these split very nicely if you just sort of put a little knife right there and, and split it right down. Um, and, uh, and then you just take a fork or something, they're, they're hard as nails, the little pupae. So when you're harvesting them, they kind of pop out and might fly around the room, but they're okay. Um, so just a tip when I'm cutting these, there's one end and uh, I would cut them on the bottom end because it's gonna be bigger on the bottom than the top. And you kind of want it to taper in if, if anything. So the back of the hole is gonna be slightly smaller than the front of the hole. And also that um, each one of these reeds has a little sheath on it. So let me just cut one and I'll show you when I, why I mentioned that. One moment. Safety first. Bill, I'm doing a little casual research and it looks like October. Does that sound right? So, oh, so when I cut, um, by cutting at the, at the, um, at the bottom, um, it's going to be bigger at the bottom than at the top, which is up here. And also, when you cut at the bottom, you're cutting where that, where the leaf sheet is, so it just slides right off the tube. So it makes it much easier to clean them that way. So you don't have to pull all those leaves off by hand beforehand, like this. You can just cut it, and away you go. So I pre-cut a bunch of tubes here, and um, these are the bottoms. Let's see if I have enough to fill this. Almost. I probably want two or three more um, and that'll do it. But they're all way too long, right? So I'm gonna trim this off as well. 
And what I'm using here on this saw is a really fine tooth because if it's spinning really fast and the teeth are really small, then this won't shred as much. Now, if you don't have this and you really want these, then just give me a call. And I, I keep this machine here at Ag Hall and we can make plenty of tubes. Um, I'm gonna make a few more so I can fill this nest. Um, I think there's one, two, bear with me. That's all we need. Try it again. That's a pretty snug fit. But I do believe there's one or two more. on the one I cut. Well, after I make the cut, well, it's it's a little closed, kind of. Um, you can just ream it out a little bit. Let's see if this will do it. I stepped on that one. So, one more. Let's do it. So now I have this nice tight bundle, but I need to trim it down. So what I'm gonna do is um, bundle them all together and then do one more chop. But I wanna make sure I don't chop it um, too far, but I have to chop it and you know, I don't want it sticking out either. So um, let me grab a new rubber band. This is the last step. find that if you keep it bundled together while you're making the cut, then they don't, um, they cut a little cleaner too. Right. My bundle. And now, something I forgot to mention is that I'm going to cut. So, so the way I cut this is that this will be the bottom against the bottom of the can, and it's important that you that these are sealed, that the end is sealed, because the um, the bee wants a nice compartment, right? It doesn't want to see any airspace or a gap at the back of the hole. So when you cut these, again, just cut them right above the, the joints, right? So that it's sealed at the bottom. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a, the, the, uh, comp the, the node, right? Is right be beyond that hole there, just a couple of millimeters. But this end is the open end, the other end. That's the end we want the bee to enter. Now I'm gonna go pretty slow because I wanna make a nice clean cut. Hold your ears. Ah. <laughs> Uh, 
doesn't have to be perfect, but I want them to enjoy their new home. Okay, here we go. Shouldn't take too long. Looks pretty good. Great. And again, if you want, you can kind of ream those out, but they look pretty decent to me. So that's the bundle. Take off the rubber bands. Drop them all in the can. Yeah, that's pretty close. So I'm gonna get that little cover courtesy of somebody to throw it out on the street and wedge it in there. I might have to take out one or two of the tubes. And there we go. So like that's a usable Mason Bee House. I'll put this up uh, maybe in my garden and um, and you'll pretty soon, within another six weeks or so, you'll start to see some of these entrances being uh, sealed shut. They almost never use, um, fill up the hole, uh, all, all of the holes in any given year, but they'll do some and then you can take those out and harvest them, put some more in and you'll see more holes being filled the next year, year after year. So, I'm gonna run back inside where I can see. And uh, are there, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? I have um, two quick questions. Sure. Is there an ideal length for the uh, length of the tubes? And also, could you say something about harvesting the pupae again? I kind of missed that. Okay. Um, yes, the length is, uh, the, the length is important. Um, I think Nick the other night said five to six inches, and that's pretty much what you hear. Um, you don't want it too long, um, uh, and you definitely don't want it too short. Yeah, five to six inches seems like the, the sweet spot. And again, these ones are about four and a half, uh, but um, I'm sure they'll make use of them. And oh, harvesting. So let me get one of those tubes and I'll show you what I was talking about. So I think it's sometime in the fall when you can do this because the, the bee has a really strange lifespan. Like it, it, it has a two egg, two or three egg stages and then it, it becomes a larvae. And the larvae is actually very, the, the, it's in a larval stage for quite a while. So it's um, vulnerable, right? Um, Bill, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I looked it up. And it seems like, does this sound right to you that by the end of September they're done? So people harvest yeah. in October? Right, okay. yeah. So they, they are, they're larvae for quite a while in there, but very inactive and, and I guess growing and then they pupate, yeah. Actually they do some, yeah, anyway, thank you. That's good. Um, so then sometime around September, uh, maybe give it a week or so more um, just to be sure um, around here because it's warmer climate, maybe global warming and all of that. Um, then you would take out the tube that has, uh, that you see mud in um, and, um, and you would split it right down the middle and it opens right up. And then you would see, you almost, this sort of looks like it's compartmentalized. We can imagine that those are the compartments that the bee is nested in, but you'll see the, the pupa in there. They're, um, oh gosh, uh, the size of your, uh, the, the, the width of your baby finger, uh, uh, fingernail um, and dark, and you can't really mistake them. Sometimes there'll be a little food mixed in there and these little discs of mud, which are really kind of cool um, and beautiful, but, uh, but that's it. Yep. And then 
Um, I'll show you what I meant about the Raspberry container. Um, there is a company called Crown B that, uh, you know, systematizes all of this, but basically, you know, this is, this is the kind of container that they sell that uh, you can put your pupae in and you keep them there uh, on this little uh, damp mat on the bottom. It sort of looks like a strawberry container, right? And, um, and you keep it in the fridge until the temperatures are right in the spring, which is fairly consistent days above 50 during the day. Any other questions? Would the plastic- um, Yes, there were a couple questions. Bill, the diameter of, if you were gonna drill them out, or just so we know if, you know, people are using something other than the Phragmites, what's the ideal diameter? I, I think it's five sixteenths. Okay. I think. Which is and then you I think you're going to cover this, but people are wondering about like where to hang it. Um, does it need sun, shade? Right. That kind of thing. Good, good. Yeah, these are all good questions. So um, I've been told that, uh, that it works sort of the same way with beehives as well. You want to hang it if you can um, facing uh, south or east because you'll take advantage of early and consistent sun, right? In the winter time, it'll, if you don't harvest in the winter time, at least it'll, it'll get that sun. I suppose that's better. I mean, they're very hardy little critters and they could probably go down below 15, below zero, but um, I guess a little sun in the winter doesn't hurt. But um, like, uh, like our honeybees, um, if they're facing a little bit east as well, uh, they're gonna be more active in their, um, they're, they're going to get that early morning sun and it'll wake them up and get them going sooner. So, um, um, so the harvesting is just to give them like a better chance of surviving. Is that right? Like you could leave them, but you're sort of taking good care of them by bringing them in. Right. Yeah. So there, there are, um, I don't think you can avoid the, the wasps because I think that they parasitize uh, the, the, uh, the larvae, I think, or maybe even the egg. Uh, stage right in, in early on, but but um, there are the flickers and the woodpeckers and things like that that will pull them out, um, and, uh, and and what's the other? Oh, and the mites, of course. So um, if if you leave, if so, if a, if you have a new tube, it's populated. Uh, the adults emerge the next April. Um, there will be apparently there will be mites in there that, but not a very high level of mites, but mites are sort of everywhere. They're like ticks, right? They're, they find, they are very good at finding their host, right? So, um, so you don't wanna leave the mites in there because the, the next year, if, if in, the sub, in the following April, it, that hole is repopulated, then you'll have more mites coming in from the queen laying her eggs and the mites that are already there so, so they say, but that picture of the mite covered bee, sure, put the fear of God in me. So the fear of mites in me. So I, I think the general rule of thumb is you do want to harvest them. I think even Nick suggested it the other day. Okay, great. It just seems like a lot of intervention, but, um, and I like to do things, I like nature to do it, but in this case, I think it does increase their chances, so. Yeah, that was a, that was a terrible picture. Um, yes. Somebody is wondering, <laughs> Um, two questions are in here. So one, someone's wondering if they have to, if it matters how close they are to honeybee hives. I don't think it matters. Yeah, different. They, they, well, they, they visit the same flowers, but the mason bees are out uh, much earlier than honeybees are, or they're, they're, they're up and out earlier. So I, I, no, I, I don't think it matters. Okay, great. And then Annette is just, I think, more just pointing out if you do something more elaborate that you'd have to, you know, take into account that you need to remove and replenish the tubes yearly. Mm. I think that's part of what's so nice about your design, how simple it is. And you're just using yeah. readily available material right. and destroying it. Yeah. Again. It took me 10 minutes. Yeah. Now, I see a question about um, the, uh, with the plastic cup uh, create increased humidity. I didn't actually use the whole cup. I cut it. Um, so I'm just sort of building a, a like a cap, right? Like a sunscreen or shades, a uh, rain cover, an awning, right? Sorry. <laughs> so, but 
but it raises a really good point. The humidity is not good. So the drier you can keep it, the better, which is probably why wood, I mean, unless you can keep this really dry and I think this cover will, because once I get it in there, I pull it out again and now, but uh, once once it's in there, it covers half of the, you know, the, so I, I, th I think this will keep it pretty darn dry, but, but wood breathes, right? So as long as you have a, a good roof on it that doesn't leak, um, you're good. Um, one last question I saw was uh, when you're when you're bringing them out in the cocoons. Um, so you said it, it wants to be fifty degrees consistently. Just do you put where do you put them? You know, I I uh, had a native bee house that my mother gave me, and I thought it's the silliest looking thing, and I hung it up anyway, and. And then in the wintertime, I brought it onto the porch. You know, it's not heated. And I left it there. And then uh, in April, I think it was like very early April, I saw these bees flying around inside the porch. And it took me uh, about 30 seconds, but I finally figured it out. Um, I, so anywhere protected, really. Um, what, they, uh, what, what you might see if you look at some of those links, I saw uh, somebody who just put them in a cardboard box and um, and poked a hole in the bottom of the box uh, or in the, the so let's see I have lots of boxes here oh, except that most of them are full huh. I thought this would be easier so let's say you put them in a box like this um, just poke a hole right here and and leave them somewhere dry and they'll come out they'll hatch and come out so but by putting them in that box, it means that they're protected from other critters. So Great. Don't just I, sort of scatter them on the lawns. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Yeah. I think we answered everything in the chat. Does anyone have any any last questions? You can either unmute yourself or put them in the chat. Um, what if leaf cutters share tubes? Can you harvest them all the same way? Share the tube. They wouldn't share the same tube, but um, but they will share the tube right next door, and um, yeah, they you harvest them all the same way. Yep. Yeah. They. Uh, I, I think what I meant was the same. Um, you know, the whole nesting area, because I know we have something at our garden, and uh, yeah, if there. Are, there's different uh, critters in there. <laughs> yeah. And you harvest them all. Can you, and, and you can tell that it's a leaf cutter, you know, by its uh, cell walls and um, mason bee. I mean, is the likelihood that they may all share that same little house? Yes. And that, that's why you want a variety of sizes too. There's one up here that's really small. That might be a good one for a leaf cutter. There's all another right. one in there. But some of the other ones will be great for mason bees. But you raise a really good point, and one that I really don't know the answer to because leaf cutters are more summer bees, and um, and and the mason bees are really they're done by middle of May, right? right? Um, so that would suggest to me that the pupa are going to pupate at a different time too. So yeah, you you wouldn't want to mix. The, if when harvest time comes, and I'm assuming that harvest time is probably about the same, maybe a little later for leaf cutters, but when harvest time comes, you might want to hold off a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think it matters how late you harvest, except you don't really want to go into January, maybe. But but I wouldn't I wouldn't harvest any earlier than September, and I don't think the mites are doing any damage to those pupa in there. If they are, it's already too late because the mites are inside the pupa probably. So I guess what I'm getting at is that if you wait till November, probably, then it's safe to harvest all of the pupa leaf cutters and mason bees. But I don't know for sure. So it might might, um, might be good to check. So I think I have one more question. I don't want to monopolize the time. But do you do all that washing and rinsing and some people say you clean them with a mild bleach solution and that's one of the things oh, yeah. that concerns me because I, I, I'm not sure that I want to do all that and if it's necessary. But I read some type of a, 
I think it was some other webinar and they said they they wash them, they do all sorts of things. Hmm. Do you do any well, of that? They, they do, you can buy them. You can buy the chrysalises, the, the, the pupa and uh, they'll ship them to you in, in a box and you get, you order a hundred or 50 or whatever. I guess it's mainly for pollination services, but um, those I would imagine, you know, if they're shipping across state lines, they would have to clean them really well. Um, and again, they are really tough, those chrysalis to sell. Um, but when you harvest the chlorine, do you do all that? No, I don't, no. I've only okay. harvested once and it was a, several years ago, but uh, no, I just popped them out and put them in a box and bought yeah. your uncle. That's kind of something that deters me because somebody I know did and then she told me all her process of cleaning and washing and removing mites and i thought oh my god that's a lot than i think i wanted to do but well, anyway that's <laughs> yeah that's the, the one thing that, that that i thought the reason why you might want to wash it is because the mites are on the surface or maybe even the mite uh -huh. I, I know actually i don't know if mites lay eggs i i think they don't but um but anyway that the um yeah i i, I can't imagine using bleach but I, I, you know, the chrysalis is so hard that I can't imagine why not. Yeah, so I, I would, you know, solution. I did put a bunch of references at the end of this, and um, I'm hoping that maybe you'll find the answer there. Okay. There's a company called Crown Bees. Uh, they're the ones that really do the most with mason bees. Um, and uh, there's a, um, uh, I think they're, I think that they're, what I sent, um, what what you'll see is a hopefully is a link to a Google Drive. And there, in there you'll find some references, and then you'll also find a document that I put in there from Crown Bees, all about raising native. Um, I think mostly mason bees, and I'm sure they mention it in there. But I'm sorry, I okay, no, I, I didn't do that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Sure. I'm from Pennsylvania, so I uh, I'm a little. Uh, we don't have much going on here yet. We just had a horrible storm yesterday. So after this is done, I have to go pick up all my tree limbs and everything else out in the yard. Oh, boy. So, uh, right. Yeah, it was windy all throughout the East Coast. So what, what part of Pennsylvania? You must be up in the uh, uh, inland a bit. Because it's, uh, it's, it's fairly mild here, I would imagine, in, in Philly and that area would be as well. But Anyway, good luck. Thank you so much, Bill. That was great. I'm excited to sure. see how simple it is. I'm going to I'm going to do it. Maybe today. Good. I guess we should all right. kind of get on it, right? Now's the time. Now is really the time. Yeah, get them out there as soon as you can. Yeah. Okay. And if you're thinking of doing bumblebees, uh, uh, bumblebee nest or something like that, again, you'll see the queen bumblebee flying about a foot above ground. Um, and uh, that's that's a, uh, the sign of that the bumblebees, the queens have emerged from their hiding places in mouse burrows and places like that. And they're, they're looking for a home. They just kind of do reconnaissance at about a foot above the ground, so. Great, yeah. thank you so much. Good luck, everybody. Sure. Always fun. Inspired. Thanks, um, everyone. I just wanna point out, I put a link for our native plant sale in the chat also, City Natives, check it out if you're looking for some plants to also help you support native pollinators. We grow them all Definitely. in Boston and we're, we have, online pre-order now. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Bill. Have a good weekend. Sure. Thank you, Michelle. You too. Bye, everyone.